let's talk some more about four vectors, which I'll define here again for reference. Recall that four vectors are vectors with four components, one time component and three spatial components. When viewed in different inertial reference frames, they transform according to this equation involving the Lorentz transformation matrix lambda. And because of this property, their magnitudes are calculated using this matrix equation involving the Minkowski metric, and those magnitudes are Lorentz scalars. They do not change in different inertial reference frames. We described in the last video how the displacement vector capital X, which represents the displacement from an event A at the space-time origin to an event B at some arbitrary space-time location, we described how this displacement vector is a four vector. Now, the question becomes, if we can formulate a four vector version of displacement, then can we also formulate a four vector version of the derivatives of displacement like velocity and acceleration? Of course, and that's what we'll go over in this video. We'll start with the four vector version of velocity, also known as four velocity. Just like with regular velocity in three dimensions, we can get the four velocity of a particle by taking the time derivative of the displacement four vector of the particle. But then we immediately run into trouble. Time usually isn't an invariant quantity in special relativity, so which time do we take the derivative with respect to? Time is relative. According to time dilation, the time between two events measured by observers in different inertial reference frames is different. It's not the same as in classical physics. If we take, say, the regular time derivative of capital X, we end up with a quantity whose magnitude will change depending on the inertial reference frame you're in. To show this, let's take the time derivative of the displacement four vector, so the derivative with respect to regular t. When we do that, this is the vector we'll end up with, where the first component is just c. Now, when we take the magnitude squared of this four vector, we get the negative squared of the first component plus the sum of squares of the other three components. The sum of squares of the last three components is just v squared, which is the magnitude squared of the particle's velocity in three dimensions, or the three velocity. But the problem with this magnitude squared expression is that the three velocity depends on the inertial reference frame I'm using to measure it. If I'm going in the opposite direction as the particle whose three velocity I'm taking, I end up with a large v squared term. If I'm going in the same speed and direction as the particle, then my v squared in that particular reference frame becomes zero. This means that the derivative of my displacement four vector with respect to t does not have a magnitude which is a Lorentz scalar because the magnitude changes depending on the observer's inertial reference frame. But if we want the time derivative of capital X to also be a four vector, then our magnitude cannot change with different inertial reference frames. And that's why the regular time derivative of a displacement four vector is not a four vector. So if we can take the derivative with respect to time of some random inertial reference frame to get four vector velocity, what time derivative can we take? Recall from a couple of videos ago that the proper time is a Lorentz scalar. It does not vary with the Lorentz transformation. And indeed, when we do take the derivative of the displacement four vector with respect to the particle's proper time, we end up with a velocity four vector, which I'll call capital U. An important thing to note is that if we consider a really small interval of proper time, which we'll call d tau in the particle's reference frame, then in terms of the corresponding really small regular time interval dt between two infinitesimally separated events, the equation describing the relationship between d tau and dt is just the time dilation equation. Here, gamma sub v is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v squared is the magnitude squared velocity of the particle, whose proper time interval is being measured, relative to the reference frame that is measuring the corresponding regular time interval dt. Now, in this equation for gamma, the v squared is the magnitude squared of the particle's velocity relative to the reference frame being used to measure the dt. In terms of dx, dy, and dz, v squared is then just the sum of dx by dt, dy by dt, and dz by dt whole squared. It's just the three velocity we talked about earlier. So now, based on this relationship between dt and d tau, we can see that dt by d tau is just gamma sub v. I'm going to call this equation 1, and it's going to be important to remember this equation when we talk about other four vectors like acceleration and momentum. Anyway, going back to our definition for the four velocity u, we can re-express this using the chain rule as the product of dx by dt times dt by d tau. But we already showed what dx by dt was earlier on, and we have equation 1 that tells us what dt by d tau is, so when we plug those in, this is what we get for our four velocity u. I'll call this equation 2. So this is our four velocity u in column vector form, 
it has four components. The first is the time component, and the other three are spatial components that actually correspond to the Lorentz factor gamma times the three velocity v in the observer's inertial reference frame. If we want to find the magnitude squared of this four velocity, then we can just perform this matrix product using the Minkowski metric eta. When we do that, we get negative gamma sub v squared times c squared plus gamma sub v squared times the sum of squares of dx by dt, dy by dt, and dz by dt. Now the term in the parentheses is just v squared, as we've talked about before. If we now plug in our gamma squared as 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared and take that common, this is what we get. And if we further simplify this expression by multiplying the numerator and denominator by c squared and then canceling the denominator with the term outside the fraction, we get negative c squared as the magnitude squared of our 4 velocity. Now there's some important things to be gleaned here. The first is that the magnitude of my 4 velocity is a Lorentz scalar. The speed of light is obviously a Lorentz scalar because it doesn't change with inertial reference frames. That's the second postulate of special relativity. The speed of light squared is then also a Lorentz scalar by extension. So that means that the magnitude of the 4 velocity is then a Lorentz scalar, which is what we want for a 4 vector. The other thing to note is that the magnitude squared of my 4 velocity is negative, which makes it a time-like 4 vector. Remember, time-like 4 vectors have a negative magnitude squared, space-like have a positive magnitude squared, and light-like 4 vectors have a zero magnitude squared. So that should just about cover it for the 4 velocity, the 4 vector version of velocity. Let's now talk about 4 acceleration, the 4 vector version of acceleration. Just like how the 4 velocity was the proper time derivative of the displacement 4 vector, the 4 acceleration, capital A, can be expressed as the proper time derivative of the 4 velocity. To get the components of the 4 acceleration, we can apply the proper time derivative to the individual components of the 4 velocity like so, by substituting in the expression for the 4 velocity from equation 2. We can use the chain rule to convert all these proper time derivatives to derivatives with respect to regular time t as follows, by having dt by d tau out front this time. If we then evaluate the first component and then apply the product rule to the other three components, this is what we get. Note that I've already substituted dt by d tau as gamma based on equation 1. The tricky part here though is evaluating the time derivative of the Lorentz factor gamma, but there is a slightly roundabout way. Let's go on the side and evaluate this derivative. Now gamma is actually really a function of v directly, the magnitude of the particle's 3 velocity. So we can write this t derivative of gamma using the chain rule as d gamma by dv times dv by dt. Because gamma is given by the square root function, the derivative of gamma with respect to v is just v over c squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared to the power of 3 over 2. And I got this by applying the chain rule. The involved part though is taking the derivative of dv by dt. Now the v being differentiated with respect to t is just the square root of the magnitude squared of the 3 vector v. The magnitude squared is just the dot product of the vector v with itself, so we can change the derivative to the following. If we now let some other function w equal the dot product of the 3 vector v with itself, then this derivative becomes the following. We can then use the product rule to evaluate dw by dt and get the following when we plug back in the 3 vector v. Now this term in the denominator out front in the square root is just our v. Meanwhile, this t derivative of the 3 vector v is actually just the 3 acceleration, which I'll call small a with an arrow on top. And since the dot product is commutative, these two terms inside the parentheses are the same, and so we can cancel the two outside to obtain the following equation for the t derivative of v in terms of the 3 vector v for velocity and the 3 vector a for acceleration. For your reference, I've also written down the expressions for v and a here in terms of their column vector forms. So finally, this means that my t derivative of gamma is the following when we plug this in. I can cancel the v's and recognize that this 3 over 2 power term in the denominator just represents gamma cubed. Taking advantage of this, my t derivative of gamma simplifies to the following. Let's now go back and plug this into the expression we had for the acceleration 4 vector. We'll cancel the c's in the first component and take an additional gamma common from the last three components to get the following acceleration 4 vector. So in the end, this is our expression for our acceleration 4 vector. We can simplify it a bit more by using the 3 vector velocity and 3 vector acceleration in the spatial components. Let me now copy paste my velocity 4 vector now to analyze this acceleration 4 vector.
if we now take the inner product of the velocity 4 vector and the acceleration 4 vector, we get negative of the product of the first components, because remember we're in Minkowski space, plus the sum of the product of the other three spatial components. The first term just becomes the negative of gamma to the 5 times the dot product of the three vectors of v and a. The second term becomes the following. Now v dot v is just v squared, so we can then take the v dot a common from both terms inside the brackets to get the following. Since gamma squared is just 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared, we can plug that in to get the following expression. If we then add these two terms in the brackets, we just end up with gamma squared. So in the end, after all that work, we find that the dot product of the velocity 4 vector and the acceleration 4 vector is just 0. So the velocity 4 vector, no matter what, is always orthogonal to the acceleration 4 vector. This makes sense because the velocity 4 vector has a constant magnitude squared, negative c squared as we discussed before, so no matter what, the magnitude of the 4 velocity doesn't change. This means that the 4 acceleration only really changes the direction of the 4 velocity, so it only acts perpendicular to the 4 velocity with no parallel component. Of course, this isn't the case in classical mechanics with the acceleration 3 vector. The main situation that the three-dimensional acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity is when you've got uniform circular motion, your particles traveling in a circle with constant speed. Let's now bring back our acceleration 4 vector for a little more analysis. If I happen to be in an inertial reference frame where the velocity of the particle is instantaneously zero, but the particle is still accelerating, then the velocity 3 vector in that inertial reference frame becomes zero, and that means our 4 acceleration becomes a lot more simplified. We can also write this 4 acceleration in this situation as zero and a naught, where a naught is the proper acceleration. It's the acceleration of the particle that's measured in a reference frame in which the particle is instantaneously at rest, meaning that the observer is traveling at the same velocity as the particle in that particular instant. Now, the magnitude of the proper acceleration, kind of like the proper time, is a Lorentz scalar. In this proper reference frame, the magnitude squared of my acceleration 4 vector is a naught squared. And because the 4 acceleration is a 4 vector, its magnitude should be invariant. It should be the same in all inertial reference frames. So the magnitude of our acceleration 4 vector in our proper reference frame, in our reference frame where we're instantaneously at the same velocity as the particle, this magnitude, this a naught squared, should be the same as the magnitude of the 4 acceleration in the reference frame in which the particle has a velocity v relative to that reference frame. In terms of vectors, the magnitude of this more simplified 4 acceleration vector this proper 4 acceleration vector should equal the magnitude of this more general 4 acceleration vector. If we then use the fact that the magnitude squared of this proper 4 acceleration is a naught squared, and if we then calculate the magnitude of the more general 4 acceleration using the Minkowski metric dot product, then we can come up with an equation for a naught, which will turn out to be the following. I haven't gone through the algebra in detail, but I trust that you can show this formula as an exercise. I'll call this equation 3. This small a squared, by the way, is the magnitude squared of my acceleration 3 vector. Now we can infer from equation 3 that because we're either squaring or taking the even power of a bunch of real numbers, the magnitude squared of the acceleration 4 vector is positive. And since this magnitude is positive, the 4 acceleration is, by definition, a space-like 4 vector, in contrast to the time-like 4 vector that 4 velocity is. Anyway, that should do it for this video covering 4 velocity and 4 acceleration. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed this lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.